Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to this evening's webinar, which is brought to you by the advisory services in the Longford Roscommon region. The topic of our webinar this evening is land mortality. So my name is Penny Gavin. I'm a Walsh scholar based in the Roscommon office, and I'll be hosting the webinar this evening. We have two speakers this evening, Damien Costello and James Kelly. Damien is a speech a sheep specialist based in the Athenry office and James is a dry stock advisor based in the Ross Common office. They will each be presenting for 20 minutes and after that we will have 20 minutes left for questions. Owen Callahan is a Walsh scholar and he's based in the uh, Castle Re office and he'll be um, carrying out the, uh, the Q&A session this evening so you can send in your questions using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen um, and all of the questions will be addressed at the end of the session today. The webinar will run for approximately an hour, so make sure if you're on a mobile phone that you have it well charged up or, or plugged in. Um, just before we, we kick off, I'd like to just mention two things. Um, first of all, the deadline for the sheep census has been extended. The postal version has been extended until the 14th of February. So both the postal and online version now are have to be submitted by the 14th of February. Secondly, the organics farming scheme opens on the 9th of February and will be open for new applications uh, until the 8th of April. Just a little health and safety note as well, coming into this time of the year, lambing, um, we try and get a rest when you get the chance, see, eat proper meals and ask for help if needed from, from family members or, or neighbours. And just maybe to remember to wash your hands and wear gloves to help prevent the spread of zoonotic diseases and things like that as well. So to start off this evening, uh, James Kelly is going to start off looking at pre-lambing management and nutrition. So James, if you'd like to, to share your screen. Okay, Penny. Yeah. Can you see that there now, Penny, yeah? Yes. Okay, folks, we'll kick off there. So I am, um, as Penny said there, I'm gonna go through the period before the OLM is basically pre lamin management and pre lamin nutrition. So just to give a bit of a background there to lamb mortality, it is the time of the year on a sheep farm that really has a huge bearing on profitability. It's the time of, it's that three to four week period where the losses, where you're going to lose most sheep on a farm, most heads, if you know what I mean. It's that, period of three to four weeks really intense where you want to keep losses to an absolute minimum. Approximately 50% of lambs die in the first 24 hours of life. Now that's an interesting statistic enough like if you think about all the lambs that are born on the farm, all the lambs that are die, that first 20, initial 24 hours is critical importance, is of critical importance. And what mortality are we looking at? A target mortality should be less than 12%. Now, a lot of farmers are achieving mortality, lamb mortality figures of less than 12%, but it's very closely linked to scanning rate. Like if you have a scanning rate of 2.1, 2.2 lambs per year, obviously you're going to have a lot more smaller non-viable lambs. So your mortality is going to be a little bit higher. But a target there of 12% is what we're aiming for. Some farms are doing better than that, other farms that are scanning a little bit higher are a little bit more than 12%, but that is the figure that we put out there to be a target to get under. So as I said, the first 24 hours is critical, but to get the first 24 hours, to get the 24 hour, first 24 hours correct, we're going to look at two areas here tonight. Firstly, I'm going to do the pre and management, pre and management and the nutrition. And Damien then is going to look at the hygiene part of lamin. So what are the causes of lamb mortality? This is a study here done by Tim Keady and Alan Bohan in 2019 in Athenry. So we have all the various different causes on the pie chart there. Hygiene here. 23% of farmers do not clean and disinfect lamb and pens. That's an interesting statistic. Colostrum, 9% of farmers only use artificial colostrum. And dicosia, 68% of farmers scan, but they do know the lamb and there. So a lot of farmers are scanning, but they're not rattling the sheep going to the ram. They don't have them grouped into, you know, when they rattle the ram, they don't 
when the let out the Rams, the aren't rattling them per week, say go yellow the first week, go green. They're not batch per week. So while they are scanning them, they still haven't condensed down the lamb and dash to a particular week. So going back to it, preparing for lambing starts the day you let out the ram. Even if you're rattling the ram, rams going out the day you're, when you let them out mating, if you rattle the rams, you're helping cut down lamb mortality because it leaves you in a position that you're able to group the yos better, say yellow the first week, green the second week, onto red, onto black, the various different colors. So before the yo lambs at all, a huge amount of preparation can be done in reducing lamb mortality on farms. So today, most yos are scanned. They're scanned, I put in a figure there of 1.8. It's a good figure there for lowland yos in the region. They've scanned 1.8 lambs per yo. Most farms in our region here are lambing in the month of March and they're weaning in the month of July. So if we look there, most farms are scanning 1.8, they're weaning 1.6. So the difference between 1.8 and 1.6 there is approximately 12%. So that's the lamb mortality that we're, we're judging from the day you scan to the day you wean. Okay, that's where we're getting our 12%. So what can I do to reduce losses this year? So as we go back here, this is where we are at the minute. We're in here between scanning and lambing here in March. So what can I do to reduce losses this year? Two focus areas, pre-lambing management and hygiene at lambing. As I said, Damien's going to do the hygiene at lambing there and we'll just go through the pre-lambing management here. So the target for this period is birth weight and colostrum. We want good birth weights. We want ideally singles coming out of the yos at six kilos live weight, one twins coming out five kilos and triplets coming out four kilos. Like this is all down to feed and management. As lambs go up into, as single lambs go up into seven, eight, nine kilos, you get into difficult births, you get into higher losses. On the other side of it, if you have triplets coming out under three kilos, you have very you have a lot of non-viable lambs. So we're feeding to get these birth weights. We're feeding the sheep, the pregnant Joe, in the last six weeks to get these birth weights of six kilos single, five kilos twin, four kilos triplet, as accurate as we can. And thereafter, adequate, adequate colostrum. What we mean by adequate colostrum there is we're looking for quantity and quality of colostrum. Ideally, a yo should be producing one liter of colostrum in the first 24 hours. So as we can see there, if a yo has two lambs, she's going to have 10 kilos. She's going to have 10 kilos of lambs. Then she's going to have all the fetal fluids. You know, there's a big loss in that first initial 24 hours, there's a huge demand for water, a huge demand on the yo. So it is critically important to have definitely those multiples, those twins and those triplets fed correctly. The single yo, she'll get on just because it's one lamb, she has more ability for to get through it even better. But it's important here that the twins and the triplets receive extra attention and that there is adequate colostrum there for them. So that is the target of our feed and management and our management and our nutrition pre lamin to get to this. Those weights here and the adequate colostrum. So what do we mean by pre lamin nutrition? We're looking at your nutrition. Now, getting late now for forage analysis, but we would be encouraging farmers to get their silage, get a silage test done, develop and implement a feeding plan. Obviously, stands to reason if the silage is poorer, you'll have to go in with meal earlier, you'll have to go in with more meal. If the silage is better, you'll get away with a little bit less meal and you'll get away with a shorter feeding period pre lamin Feeding according to litter size, most farmers are doing this. You'll be feeding the yos six, seven weeks out. You'll be feeding them according to if they're triplets, you'll be starting off seven, eight weeks out. If they're twins, you'll be starting off six weeks out. 
And it is important as well to feed the singles some meal. Like some farmers out there don't believe that singles might need they might need that much meal, but it is important, especially on high litter size flocks, to feed the single yo's meal for approximately three weeks pre lamin because it will give them that boost in colostrum so that with high litter sizes you'll be able to cross foster some of the triplet lambs across onto the singles but if the single yo hasn't been receiving adequate nutrition she's not going to have enough milk she's not going to have enough colostrum to take on a lamb so definitely on high litter size flocks it is important to feed singles so that they have that ability for cross fostering. Ensure that ensure a high quality ration is used in late pregnancy. What do we mean by that? There, we're looking for soya bean meal, the golden ingredient. There, we're looking for ideally as close to twenty percent soya bean meal in a yo and lamb nush coming into the last three to four weeks, as you can get. The protein. In soya bean meal, it isn't broken down in the room and it goes straight through to the small intestine and it's absorbed by the yo. It's absorbed through the yo, it goes straight into the lamb. So if you're feeding a 20% soya bean meal ration in the last two, three weeks and you're getting a yo up on 0 0.8, 0 0.9 of a kilo a day, say a twin bearing yo, a triplet bearing yo, you're talking, she's taking in she's taken in 0 0.8, 0 0.9 of a kilo of meal. She's taken in a significant quantity of soya bean meal. She's taken in, in around 200 grams of soya bean meal. If that split with her, with two lambs, you're talking the lamb is getting 100 grams of soya bean meal. The vast majority of lamb growth in the O occurs in the last six weeks pre lamin There's a huge surge there. So 75% of the lamb grows in the last six weeks. So there's a huge demand there for protein, be it from the lamb growing, be it for maintenance for the yo, and be it for colostrum production. So the high quality ration is important. Now, this is a year the farmers may look at ration prices. Ration prices have gone up, fertilizer prices have gone up, inputs have gone up, and there will be a temptation there to cut back a little bit on rations going in to a yo in late pregnancy. It's not a base to make a cut. It's a yo carrying two lambs, a yo carrying three lambs. It's not what I'd recommend. It's not a saving I'd recommend because that is the period when the yo is under most pressure just coming into lambing. Very high demand on the yo. I don't believe it's a good cut even at current meal prices. Yeah, the yo has to be fed. If she has the litter size, she has to be fed. Minimize your body condition loss in late pregnancy. If sheep are in a shed and they're sheared, it's very easy to see body condition score because obviously the wool is off them. You can see them, you know, it's very visible. But yours that are outside with a fleece, nine months of a fleece of wool on them, it might be very hard. So it goes down to handling the sheep. If they're at a trough outside, just handling them the odd time, you know, just putting your hand on their backs, you'll know very quickly if there's body condition score loss. Now, if the yours are being fed and they're being well looked after and condition is falling off them, you know, you have to look, is fluke a problem? Is there, what, is there a fluke burden on the farm? Quite often now, this time of the year, if sheep are on farms that have a fluke problem, it can manifest itself now from, say, sheep picking up fluke in November, December. It can manifest itself now when the sheep gets under pressure, the immunity is down, fluke can take over. So it's important just to keep an eye on body condition score coming into late pregnancy. Then feed management here. This here is, a lot of this here is common sense. Correct feeding space at Tra. We'd be talking a yo needs 600 mil, which is approximately two foot of Tra space. Now, in a shed, she'll definitely need this. If you're feeding outdoors and there's a trough in a field and she can eat from both sides, this can be reduced a little. But a rule of thumb is two foot of feeding space in a shed. Constant access to roughage as meal is going up, as meal is going up, you'll obviously step it up. You'll step it up gradually. You'll start off six weeks out at 0.1 of a kilo, gradually lifting it up to 0 0.6, 0 0.7. 
pre-lamin, depending again on the condition of the O and the litter size. But you need constant access to roughage. Remove, refuse stale material twice weekly. You know, ideally you're not going to leave it there. The freshness of silage, the freshness of feeding the forage as well. If you are feeding the more sheep that are at it and the quicker it's going, the fresher it is. Concentrates, I'm after mentioning that, introduce in time and build up gradually, build them up slowly. Once you go over 0.5 of a kilo, you should be split feeding. You should really be split feeding once you go over 0.5 of a kilo per head to a sheep. So if you're going up, if you have triplet bearing yours and you're going up to 0.9 of a kilo, kilo a meal for triplet bearing yours, they should be fed morning and evening. They should be fed as close as you can to 12 hours apart. Now, that's not awful. That's not always practical. But for triplet bearing sheep that are up on a very high level of meal, morning and evening feeding is a good idea to reduce digestive upsets. Because if you get these digestive upsets and a yo goes off or feed for a day or two, you get twin lamb disease, you get all the other associated problems. Consistency on feeding time, I'm after alluding to it there on my previous point, morning, morning, evening, try and feed them at the same time, whether it be after work in the evenings, whether it be before work in the mornings. Check clean out drinkers, especially in a shed, you know, keep the water fresh, much like the silage, keep it, keep it fresh, keep the water fresh as you can. Separate chai feeders. Listen, these are sheep that stand at the back, they won't come in, you'll see the body condition score coming off them do you know what i mean it's important to try and get them out as well as that shy feeders lame feeders lame feeders because they're sore on their feet they mightn't come into a trough as aggressively as the one that isn't lame avoid sudden changes in diet uh you'll see some farmers will go a lower category nut earlier a lower spec nut at the start of feeding up of the yos, feeding of the yos for lamb, and, and then they'll go across to a higher protein nut. You want to be careful there. You know, some people might start them off on a 16, 18% protein nut for the first three weeks, and then for the last three weeks, up them to a 20% nut. Don't forget, you are changing the nut you're feeding them. So, again, splitting the feeding there, is helpful if you are changing from one nut to another. Some farmers are doing that. If yours go off their feed, you can get twin lamb disease, same problems again. So just be just be aware of it is the main thing and just try and gradually ease it in like. And be careful housing just before lambing. You know, yours can get knocks, various different things. You'll get abortion like that. So it's handling them with care. And the last point we're going to look at here this evening, well, I'm going to look at any here, is clostridial vaccination. This is basically the 8 and 1 or the 10 and 1 vaccination that Joe's are going to get pre lamin We recommend four weeks pre lamin but you would be following the manufacturer's guidelines on this. Different products have different manufacturer's guidelines. So the main products there are Covexin 10, Heptavac, and Tribovax 10, they'll be the main product, products. So this will be done as a rule of thumb, four or six weeks pre lamin You basically inject the, or vaccinate the O and it goes across, the passive immunity will go across to the lamb. Care handling the O's, you know, you are injecting yours in late pregnancy and once you're putting into a needle into them, you know, they can jolt, they can get a jump. So you'll be very careful handling the yos, you know, keep them tight so that there's no room for really bursting away or no room to get, no room for sharp turning or anything like that. And the whole point of it is the passive immunity onto the lamb, especially in the colostrum. You know, when the lamb gets the colostrum, the passive immunity is going from the yo for these clostridial diseases onto the lamb. That will last eight weeks in the lamb in terms of pneumonia vaccination, in terms of pneumonia, it will only last, last four weeks. So it is giving the lamb a certain level of protection by giving them by giving the O a clostridial vaccinations. Clostridial vaccinations, the aren't deer, they're about 60, as a guideline, they're about 60 cent 
a sheep, 60, or 60 cent a sheep, give or take, in around that. So they're not an expensive vaccine, but they can definitely help a lot in controlling clostridial outbreaks on farms where they are a problem. So the final point I want to make there is the nutrition, pre lamin the vaccines, and the general handling of the yores. If all them are done, you'll have a lot of the work done before the yore lambs at all. So if the yore is lambing down the lamb at a correct body weight, plenty of milk for the lamb or plenty of colostrum for the lamb, the yore is strong, the yore is fish, do you know what I mean? The stronger the yore and the healthier it is, the more likely she is going to have the lamb no problem. So that preparation, that six weeks preparation that most of us here on this call are in at the minute, it is key to get it right. So I'll pass over there to Damien now. Let's stop the share here. Thanks very much, James. That was a great presentation. Um, just to remind everyone, if they have any questions for James, they can pop it into the Q&A tab down at the bottom of the screen and he'll answer it at the end of the session. So Damien, if you want to share your screen, Damien's going to look at hygiene, colostrum, hypothermic lambs, and then op options for extra lambs that you might have this year. Okay, thanks, Penny. Um, can you see? Can you see that there now? Yes, we can. Yeah. That's great. Um, so as Penny said, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, Damien Castello is my name. Um, I'm a sheep specialist based in Nathan Rye, and as James, I suppose, has outlined um, in his his talk there, uh, the, the the big importance of uh, you know getting getting prepared in advance um, in terms of nutrition. Uh, having the having the the, the right uh, nutrition, having the yaws in the right condition, uh, lambs of optimum birth weight, and so on. So now I'm going to take up the story, I suppose, um, from from the the lambing time uh, onwards and in and around the lambing time. And it's it's estimated that 25 percent of the labour in a sheep associated with a sheep enterprise takes takes place around the lambing period. So a quarter of the year's work really is is around that time. And again. Um, I suppose I'm not trying to put extra work on people or anything like that, but uh, it's it's just uh, what steps or what are the key steps you can take uh, to ensure that 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 you you've, your your hard work or your your lambs have the the best chance of survival. And uh, I suppose in terms of in terms of that, um, if we look at hygiene uh, first, and when you think of the lamb uh, during pregnancy. Uh, inside in the yaw, it's it's a really sterile environment. Uh, so I suppose it's it's a big shock to the lamb system uh, when they emerge uh, to the to the out, the outside world. I suppose so. It's really important that they're they're born into a, as hygienic an environment as possible. And you know we're we're realistic about this here. I mean, because we we understand it's a farm and it's a busy time of year and everything like that. But whatever whatever you can do, I suppose to to provide a, an environment for for the newborn lamb and for the yaw. Uh, so that they have a minimal chance of 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 picking up infection, and um, you know you're you're really increasing their 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 chances of survival. And by and large, any infection that the lamb picks up uh, comes through two routes. Really, um, the, the the first and the obvious one is they'll take in some infection through their mouth, uh, and the second one is uh, via the navel. So. I suppose whether you're outdoor or, or indoor lambing, um, a lot of people will use lambing pins. Uh, they, they'll use and newborn lambs will spend a day or two uh, in individual pins to, to bond and so on. And again, really important that these are, are clean. So we're talking about um, using uh, the likes of lime or there's, there's other products available, um, along with uh, plenty, of straw, plenty of straw bedding uh, in these pins. And you're really you're trying to create a barrier. Um, if there are any bugs or, or that in the environment or on the on the, the, the floor of the shed or in, in the environment, that you're, you're trying to create a barrier uh, between them and, and, and the and the newborn lamb. Uh, where these again, where these lambing uh, pens are located, uh, should be well ventilated area, but not a drafty area. But again, uh, you know, very buggy areas is, is not a good environment because it could be a sort of a damp atmosphere, and again, doesn't make for a clean, uh, a clean, dry environment for for the lamb. 
so ideally, again, uh, in terms of, of uh, being prepared, uh, it's a good idea to have these lambing pins set up in advance of lambing. Um, you know, you don't want to be running here and there when the first two lambs looking where are my gates and my pins. Um, if you have a number of these pins, good idea to have them set up before lambing um, and, and, and take it from there. In an ideal world, uh, I suppose the recommendation would be that you, you locate these uh, in, a, in a way that they can be cleaned out after each use. Uh, so that are, if there's, a, there's no carryover infection between one lambing and another. And again, I, as I said at the start, I fully understand that it's a really busy time when the, when the, when the lambing kicks off. But realistically, we're talking about uh, taking a few forkfuls of the, the used straw, um, taking them away, sweeping it out, uh, putting down your lime or whatever product you're using uh, and rebedding the pin. Um, again, it's about minimizing the, the, the risk uh, of, of carryover of, of infection. Uh, the second part, I suppose, in, in terms of hygiene um, is in, in terms of uh, your, your, your lambing equipment. And again, the, you can see down at the bottom there, there's lots of uh, different uh, items that you might be using at lambing time, such as lambing aids and lambing ropes and um, stomach tubes and so on. And again, a really simple uh, way of, I suppose, of having these sterile or disinfecting these is uh, what we know as, as the three bucket system. And uh, again, there's lots of people with uh, hot water sources and so on in their, in their, in their lemming sheds at this stage. Uh, but in the absence of that, uh, a cheap and cheerful way of doing it, I suppose, is if you have three buckets, um, the first bucket has um, water and a bit of washing up liquid. Uh, this, the second bucket then has just uh, clean water and the third bucket has uh, water plus uh, a sterilizing fluid, similar to what would be used, we'll say, with, with uh, baby's bottles or that one time. Um, but uh, so, uh, first of all, you, you wash, we'll say, your stomach tube, your lambing ropes uh, in the, the soapy water, uh, then you rinse them out in the in the in the clean in the the clean water, so they're they're rinsed, and then they're submerged in the in the sterilize the, the sterilizing solution. So after fifteen minutes, uh, they're, they're pretty much sterile and, and ready for use again. And the recommendation would be that you empty out these three buckets uh, once a day, uh, and that you you anytime you you need something, you need a stomach tube or, or that, you can go to your your sterile bucket, uh, take out what you need. And it's it's ready for use if you need to stomach tube a lamb or, or so on. The other aspect, I suppose, we'd say in terms of um, you know the Penny mentioned, I think at the start, the use of gloves and, and the wearing of gloves. And again, um, it, it's 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 important. It's very important that um, you use a clean glove um, anytime you're assisting a yo um, at lambing time. Uh, the last thing you want is to be introducing um, uh, you know, any infection into the OR or into the mouth of the, the, the newborn lamb as he emerges. Other areas, I suppose, to, to bear in mind as well is in terms of um, our own clothes at lemming time and everything like that, that you're, you're um, you know, keeping, keeping your, your, your outer clothes uh, fairly clean, that uh, lambs are not picking up any infection uh, from that as well. So again, uh, you know, as, as creating as, as hygienic an environment as you can for, for the newborn lambs is the first part of the story, I suppose. The second part of the story, I suppose, is the initial feed. And, you know, we, we all uh, have heard before the, the importance of, of, of colostrum. Um, and in a lot of ways, um, it probably trumps everything really in terms of, of uh, getting, getting, um, give, giving the lamb that, 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 that start he needs. Um, and the colostrum, I suppose, has three functions. Uh, first and foremost, it's a feed. It's, a, it's an energy source for the lamb. Uh, secondly, it will uh, clean out the digester tract, so that uh, black uh, gunky material that you, you see uh, pass, the, the lamb passing in, in his early hours of life, um, the, the meconium, it, it clears that out of the digester tract. And thirdly, I suppose, and probably most importantly, it's a source of immunoglobulins, and these are the antibodies uh, th these are the antibodies that that uh, really help the lamb to to fight off any infection, and it's 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 really important. And James outlined it earlier on there. Uh, firstly, I suppose feeding the oar appropriately, particularly in terms of protein, so that she has produced enough of colostrum for her lambs. Um, and the the second part of that story, I suppose, is getting it into the lamb. Uh, I don't want anybody going away this evening thinking that we're talking uh, just because of the the, the 
the picture on the, the corner of the screen there that we want to stomach tube every lamb. If the lamb gets up and suckles uh, the the colostrum directly from the mother, happy days. That's that's what we that's what we want to see. There's guidelines there, I suppose, in terms of the amount of colostrum that a lamb will drink uh, or should should get in the first six hours of life. Uh, and it's basically 50 mil uh, per kg birth weight. So if you take the five kg uh, twin lamb that James mentioned earlier on, uh, they will need 250 mils uh, for a first feed. Um, again, we talked to a lot of people uh, about this over the years to say, oh, that's that's too much. Um, you can see the 60 mil syringe uh, that's been used in the, in the photo there for stomach tubing. Uh, as I said, they hold 60 mils. So you'd be given four of those uh, of colostrum. If you needed to stomach tube the lamb, you'd be given four of those to, to, to the five kilogram lamb in a first feed. It's really important. Some people will start to say, oh, we'll give them a, li a, little, uh, give them a little bit to start off. The, the big thing about it is the transfer uh, of, of immunity, or the, 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 the transfer of these uh, immunoglobulins is highest um, in the early hours of the lamb's life and it, it it declines after that so that's why we talk about getting the the, the sufficient amount of colostrum in, in in the first feed uh, the other thing i suppose that's mentioned there about uh, supplementing uh, with colostrum substitutes um, if you take the example of uh, where uh, your lambs three lambs um, you, f you think she doesn't have enough of uh, colostrum and um, the temptation is maybe to feed the first two lambs and then mix up some subst colostrum substitute for the, the third lamb. What, what we'd be recommending, I suppose, is that you would uh, milk out the O, uh, mix up your colostrum substitute and, and make up the required amount uh, and divide it between the three lambs. So you're ensuring that every lamb has got uh, at least uh, some U.S. colostrum. Um, there's, uh, I have a short video there just on... Um, the, the administration of a glucose injection. And what we're talking about here is where uh, maybe a lamb that's um, a day old or that uh, gets hypothermic. Um, and uh, the, the, the probably the, 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 uh, the temptation in a lot of cases is uh, either to warm this lamb or to uh, stomach tube him or feed him. You'll, you'll find him in a more or less a, a comatose state. Uh, but because the temperature has dropped, um, he has used up his energy reserves uh, rather quickly. Uh, so the first thing or the first step in terms of, of trying to save this lamb um, is a glucose injection into the intraperitoneal cavity. And it's it's um, it's it's something if 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 you if you don't do that first, um, the 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 outlook wouldn't be good for that lamb. And lots of people will start to say that you know is it is it is it a risky thing to do? Generally speaking, the the it's it's probably a a free shot really because the, if if you don't do anything, um, you're probably going to lose this lamb anyway. But um, it's really to replenish uh, the the glucose uh, in the in the lamb's bloodstream followed by warming him up and then followed by feeding him. Um, this is just a, a chart uh, that uh, I borrowed from AHGB in the UK. And again, it describes the, the, the sort of procedure here that you take the lamb's temperature, um, if it's below uh, 37 degrees, you can sort of say uh, that he's severe, severely high, hypothermic. Um, if he's under five hours of age, if it's a very young lamb, you, you can warm him because he probably has enough energy reserves at that stage. So you can dry him and, and warm him in, in a warming box and he should respond. If it's a lamb that's uh, over five hours of age, um, if he's fairly lively and he's able to hold his head up and he's able to swallow and everything like that, you, you possibly will get away with stomach tubing him. If he's, as I said, if he's if he's panned out and unable to hold his head up, uh, this is where the, the glucose injection comes in. So I might just try and play, hopefully it works now, I'll just play this uh, two minute uh, video clip. It's it's from YouTube, uh, it's produced in the, in the UK. Um, so this just uh, summarizes the procedure of, of giving a, a glucose injection. Uh, 
hypothermia is a big killer of uh, little lambs um, where they, they get low blood glucose due to not having fed um, or extreme weather conditions and uh, the, the thing to treat them is to bring them to a hot box to get them warmed up um, and before that we'll give them a glucose injection into the abdomen to give the, the glucose a boost. They absorb that very quickly um, and within half an hour they're normally up and running. We'll show you how to administer that just now. So um, once you've got your warm 30ml of dextro solution, Ed, if you can just suspend the lamb by his front legs, and you place a 19 gauge 1 inch needle, uh, here's his navel, it's been sprayed, which is a good thing, um, you go 1 inch below the navel and 1 inch to the side, width of a man's thumb is about an inch, so we'll stick it in there, and you want to be angling it towards the lamb's tail head to get in the free peritoneal space. So just angle it in like that. And then inject, inject, connect the, the solution and inject your product. And then just administer the solution. And the lamb can now be transferred to hot box and uh, in about half an hour to an hour's time it should be fed with some milk once it's warmed up to temperature. Once he's been in a hot box half an hour to an hour, um, if you feel his mouth, take his temperature, check he's warm. Uh, when he's warm and active, then you can uh, stomach tube him with milk um, to give a bit more, more energy. Okay, so just to finish off then, um, that, that summarizes the, 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 um, the, the, um, the glucose injection. Just uh, briefly for the last five minutes to finish off, um, I wanted to say a, a quick few words on uh, dealing with triplets and the, the options for rearing. I'm not going to, going to, going to go into any great detail on uh, the, the management and so on of it, uh, but by and large, um, as uh, we mentioned earlier on, if you have high scanning flux, um, you know, if you have flux scanning up around two or, or, or over it, uh, maybe 25% or more of your of your yaws will be carrying uh, three lambs or more. Uh, so what are the options? Uh, the first one, again, is to cross foster. Uh, there's, I suppose, variability in terms of the success of this at farm level. Some people uh, have a lot of luck with it and more, uh, not so much. Uh, the second option is to, to rear on the yaw. Um, again, it's not for every yaw, uh, but uh, if you're if you have uh, you, if you have yaws rearing triplet lambs, they need to be managed to completely as a separate group and supplemented accordingly. Uh, a popular option, I suppose, is selling the surplus lambs um, because it saves a good bit of labour in that, um, and it's, it's very much facilitated in recent years by online advertising and so on. Um, you know, the price, uh, there is talk of, of an increased price based on the, the price increase of lambs last year. But, you know, ideally, if you had some regular customer that will, will take will take all your surplus lambs, it's, it probably works. But uh, it can be it can be a little bit hit and miss as well. And if you decide to artificially rare the surplus lambs, depending on the numbers you have, you're looking at a, either bottling them or a, some version of a multi uh, feeder uh, teeth bucket. Uh, there's also fairly basic ad lib feeders then they just have an element and uh, keep the milk warm uh, for the day and then you can spend a few thousands with big numbers on uh, these automated lamb feeders that will um, pretty much uh, mix the mix the milk and everything um, it's pretty much it's it's plumbed with with water and and so on uh, but they would be again as i say for for uh, somebody with, that would be rearing big numbers but I just want to have a look, I suppose, uh, at the at the economics of it, um, and in terms of the the increased cost to concentrates and and that this year, um, just a few key points. First, it, it is possible to efficiently and profitably rear surplus lambs. As I say, there is a, a, a labour element to it, uh, but again, if you have the proper setup, um, if you're setting up a, a pen for them, um, you should allow about 0.6 meter squared pen space. 
uh, and have this set up in advance of lambing because uh, again when things get busy it's good to have these jobs done um in terms of a uh, budgeting uh, in terms of milk replacer it, it takes about 12 to 13 kilograms um in the systems i'm going to describe here uh, of milk replacer per lamb uh, to rear them on a an, an ad lib type feeder we'll say um and it's important, I suppose, if you're going this route, that you 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 look for the the bigger bags, the twenty or twenty five kg bags are are far more are far cheaper uh, than buying it in small quantities. Again, the small five kg bags and so on are fine if you're feeding a small number of lambs. But um, if you're going to be feeding a number of them on this system, um, you need to 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 source the, the bigger bags. And again, in terms of performance, the, the key is, uh, again, appropriate pre lamb nutrition so that you have uh, three viable lambs uh, at birth. Uh, and again, very important that each lamb, uh, before they're taken off the O, uh, gets sufficient colostrum in the first 24 hours. So you're removing the lamb at that stage in 24 to 48 hours. Um, and the other important point, I suppose, is that you group uh, the lambs by age. So you maybe if you, if you are doing a number of them that you start off with the first week or 10 days maybe, um, you you have a group of similar age, uh, so it facilitates weaning them abruptly at five weeks, which is again the recommendation from a, a an economic point of view as well. Just to have a quick look at the at the costs, uh, I suppose in terms of um, the the first option I, I look at here is where they're reared on a, an ad lib uh, milk replacer. Uh, they're introduced at a, few, at a few days old and trained into eating uh, lamb creep. And then they're turned out to grass at eight to 10 weeks of age um, with a, a reduced level of, of uh, creep, I suppose, and, and pretty much finished off grass. And in terms of a cost, I've assumed um, uh, that concentrate feed uh, is about 400 euros a ton. Um, the milk replacer, um, I've got a price for there in the last couple of days. Um, the milk replacer is costing about 335 per kilogram and it's taken say 12 and a half kilograms of milk replacer per lamb. So that's a substantial cost of 4190. Um, the creep feed uh, for 70 days, uh, they'd be averaging about 0.7. Again, this is very much an average figure, uh, probably much lower than this at the start. And uh, they, they eat a bit more than that when they get going at it properly. And then I just put a 10 cent per day cost uh, for a further seven weeks afterwards uh, to, to finish them. You know, look, that, that's again an average. It can run into maybe 10 weeks or more to, to, to finish them at that stage. But in any case, it doesn't make a huge difference difference to the cost. Um, it's costing, you know, not far off 70 euros, I suppose. I've, I've put in two euros for miscellaneous costs there. Costing not far off 70 euros per lamb to, to, to rear them on this option. Um, the second option then, and uh, some people uh, go for this one, but it, it's 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 a good bit more expensive, um, in that the, the lambs are are intensively reared indoors. So again, they're on the ad lib ad lib milk, uh, they're on creep from the the start, and they're 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 pretty much finished indoors. They're they're left on creep and uh, you know slaughtered from the from the shed. So the cost of the milk replacer is the same. Uh, a little bit longer, a little bit more meal input involved in this. Uh, it's it's coming up into forty eight euro, and I've I've, I've doubled the, the miscellaneous costs in that one. So again, assuming four hundred euro a ton for the meal, so it's in or around ninety four euros. Um, using uh, using that option to to rear them and and intensively finish them, um, and the last one then I suppose is if they're left on the O, there's an additional cost in terms of uh, supplementing the O for. Uh, five weeks with a half a kilogram of meal uh, and also that the the three lambs are on creep uh, from day one so you can't give the extra lamb just the creep there all, all three lambs are on creep so uh, the cost uh, uh, of the, the, the cost of that system um, is is 37 euro 80 so look at it's the cheapest system but it's not uh, it, you know it's not it's not every year that's able to rear three lambs and um, you can have issues with with the uh, sort heats and so on um, and you can, you, she, she may be, uh, it, it may look like she's uh, getting on fine, but um, after a few weeks, uh, but in that situation, they must be managed as a, as a separate group. Um, if you're, if you have uh, yours rearing triplet lambs, they, they must be in a group of their own and fed accordingly and managed accordingly. Um, so I think it's it's just uh, in, interesting to compare the, the 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 three systems there. So 
Um, the 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 indoor intensive finishing is the, is the most expensive, but uh, maybe you'll get get your lambs out quicker. Uh, in terms of an artificial rearing system, uh, this middle one seems to make the most economic sense. Uh, that they're finished, uh, they're finished off grass and a small bit of meal, uh, turned out at maybe eight weeks of age, um, and as I say, certain certain farms are successfully rearing, uh, have have you always rearing three lambs, but um, you need to, it, it needs careful management. So just to uh, summarize, I suppose the, you know it's very important to be uh, prepared for the the upcoming lemon season, having everything you need to hand. Um, have an adequate straw. There's a guideline there of about four to five round bales per hundred joes. Uh, that's for use in the individual pens. Um, I suppose a, a lot of people who say in terms of lambing pins, you, you, you can't have enough of them when the, the lambing is at its peak. But guideline there is, is one per every eight to ten yos in the flock. But if you're very compact lambing, um, you, you may need more than that. Um, use plenty of lime and plenty of straw. Um, you know, set up your your uh, disinfectant system, your your three bucket system to to uh, to disinfect your your utensils and your your um, your gear. Um, and again, a really key important one is having a plan in place so that each lamb uh, gets gets adequate colostrum. As I say, we're not talking about stomach tube in every lamb or anything like it, but just uh, first and foremost, feeding the oil so that she has enough of colostrum to 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 to, uh, to cater for her lambs, and then making sure that 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 gets into the lambs. And again, in uh, particularly in high uh, scanning flocks, it is important that you have a, a plan uh, to deal with the surplus lambs. So I leave it at that penny. And if there's uh, if there's any questions, uh, I'll, we'll, we'll take. Them. Thanks. Great. Thanks very much, Damien. That was another excellent presentation. Um, I suppose now I'll hand over to Owen for the Q&A session. I see there's a good few questions coming in there. Yep. <laughs> so loads of activity in your questions box, which is great to see. Um, the first question here, you might throw to James. <laughs> um, have you any advice on purchasing yours in LAM? Purchasing yours in lamb, you'd really want to know the background of the sheep. Ideally, if you are going to purchase yours in lamb, you'd want to know, are, are they coming from a disease-free flock? What's the scanning rate of them? What's the age of them? Like, if they're old joes, if they're old joes, body condition is down, high litter size, you might be buying in a lot of bother. Like, it all depends on the physical appearance of the sheep themselves and thereafter the history of the sheep are the vaccinated, you know what I mean? It's an open-ended question, but there's a lot of various factors, but you'd have to take into account the physical appearance of the sheep themselves, lambs, and thereafter find out as much history about the O's as you could. But all things being equal and coming from a disease-free flock no problem just handle them with care coming into lamb and obviously if you're going transporting sheep in late pregnancy it'll have to be handling them with care like yep you perfect. wouldn't be you wouldn't be transporting them you'd be trying to do this you wouldn't like to be doing this in the last month and i put it that way you'd be trying to do it six seven weeks out from lamb and at least okay and um, damien might throw the next one to you um, how does straw compare with timber shavings as bedding? Uh, again, there there isn't any. Uh, I suppose there isn't really any scientific work. Um, it's hard to be straw really for the individual lambing pins. I suppose the the shavings uh, may have their place um, in terms of the the uh, the we'll say use in in the uh, as uh, along with straw maybe, but um, straw would be my preference. I I don't have any. Uh, I suppose scientific comparison, uh, but uh, straw, I think, is the is, is from from the point of view, particularly the point of view of individual pins, it's the it's the it's it's the best in terms of of soakage and that. But as I say, I don't have I don't have scientific evidence to back that up. But uh, that would be just my opinion on it. Yep, that's great. Um, <clears throat> James, just I'll throw this on to you. How important are minerals pre lambing? <laughs> Minerals, uh, there should be minerals in the meal. Most nuts would have minerals in them. Some farmers, if there is min mineral deficiencies on farm, they do supplement with minerals coming into the last period, coming into the latter stages of lambing or, or coming into the latter stages of pregnancy. You can go in with 
lick buckets. Some farmers go in with a drench. You can put uh, powdered, you can put a powdered mineral on top of the meal. It wouldn't be that palatable, so you'd have to go very easy with it. I suppose... Ideally, if you were getting really into this, you'd blood a couple of sheep just to see what the mineral status of the yaws is, if there was a problem with yaws, lamin or anything like that. But if farmers thought the yaws needed something, they could give them a drench. They could dust the, dust the meal with a small bit of minerals or put out lick buckets with minerals. Yeah, that's perfect, James. Thanks. Um, Damien, I'll give this one to you. Um, is there a reason that lambs are born at night and is there a way of preventing it? Uh, I suppose no uh, is the answer. There isn't any way of preventing it. Um, you know, th there is some anecdotal evidence, I suppose, that uh, I've, I've, I've spoken to uh, farmers in the past and there has been uh, some work done on this in the, in the the, in the cattle world, I suppose, more so, uh, in terms of feeding times uh, and so on. But um, th there, th the the only, I suppose, comment I'd make on it really is that I've, I've, I've heard from uh, some farmers where um, maybe if if the lights are, are turned off at night at 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock, if there's, if there's nothing happening, uh, and if you're there in the morning at first light, that... Uh, that there doesn't appear to be as, as much activity, uh, but there there isn't really any sort of hard and fast kind of rule to, to, to stopping them from lambing at night. But it would appear that if 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 lights are off or, or minimal lighting and, and minimal disturbance during the night, if they settle down for the night and they haven't started, that they they may hold on until until first light. But look, that's I wouldn't <laughs> I wouldn't uh, put I wouldn't put your I wouldn't put my house on it either. Um, but uh, they, 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 they would seem to be uh, some some level if they, if they if they're settled and there isn't uh, as much disturbance or people coming and going and checking them um, that they, they they don't tend to be as many lemon during the night. But yeah, perfect. Um, just might go back to you again, Damien, for this next one. Um, if the O hasn't sufficient colostrum after lambing, what can you do to boost it? Again, I suppose what I'd be saying in that situation, uh, a little bit of extra soya, um, but I would also be maybe maybe starting to supplement uh, the the oats that haven't that haven't that have yet to lamb with soya because it can take effect relatively quickly in a matter of less than a you know a week. Um, if you if you buy a, a couple of bags of soya um, and start supplementing. Um, just pretty much dusting a bit on top of the meal. Um, mm. A guideline would be 100 grams per per uh, per lamb carried. So if you find that the first year or two is lambing and that they're they're short of colostrum, um, you know you'll 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 still solve the the, the later or you know the 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 later lammers by by introducing it at that stage. Uh, generally speaking, I mean if if uh, that, that particular yo with with uh, feeding after lambing, you know she she can come into milk and you know if it's if it's if uh, weather conditions and so on are right, um, she she will come into milk when she's when she's turned out to grass maybe with a bit of supplementation. But you know th there's lots of reasons why individual yo's mightn't mightn't be just good milkers anyways. But um, if you find in the first few have are, are seem to be short of milk, it might be. Uh, important to address the, the feeding situation straight away so you could be feeding a ration that's that's relatively low in soybean meal so supplementing from there on uh, for the, the ones that have yet to lamb will solve the problem within a, a week or so anyways so it, it'll, it'll be a help going forward for the, for the rest of the lamb Yeah and just James I might throw this one to you just Damien touched on the soybean there but what I suppose is a substitute for soybean if it's a case where it's not available. Distillers, distillers will be an option to put in. Uh, good quality grass. If you could give them grass pre, like if you could give them grass pre lemon as well, it will boost the colostrum. We haven't talked a lot about that at all. We're all on about what we put into the meal. But if yours could get grass for two weeks pre lemon, it's amazing the way they can it can boost the colostrum in the road in them as well like so you'd be looking at distillers and would be a practical option and a bit of grass pre lamin would boost the colostrum on the yours.
Okay, and just maybe same to you, James, here for, for one minute. Um, just post lambing then, how long should you continue to feed meal to the lamb? Feed meal to the oars. Feed me, yeah, feed meal to the oars. It depends on the system. It depends on the supply of grass that's out there. Like if you're very tight on grass and, you know, if there isn't much days ahead in terms of grass for lactate and yours, you will have to keep supplementing what meal like. As well as that, a lot of farmers find it's not often, some farmers will put yours straight out to grass and cut out meals straight away, but it's a very quick, sudden, abrupt change to the diet. A lot of farmers tend to continue on for a week, two weeks, depending on depending on the quantity and quality of grass that's there and depending on weather. But most farmers will go for that week, 10 days, two weeks to get the to get the lambs initially started and move on then. But again, this year is going to be a different year with the price of ration. It all will depend on weather, grass growth, etc., how much fertilizer is spread ex- as well. But that abrupt change, that abrupt change is not good for a yo going from if you have a yo eating 0.8 point nine of a kilo a meal pre lamb and next thing she lambs <clears throat> goes out into a field of grass and next thing she's getting no meal that's not ideal either so you'll gradually reduce her down and you'll be talking week two weeks yeah perfect and just going back to damien um what is the best navel spring slash dipping product to use um yeah, I, again, I suppose there's, 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 there's always the argument is it better to to, to to spray them or dip them? Uh, personally, I have a preference for, for dipping them in that you're getting full coverage of the, the navel. Uh, the likes of, um, I've seen people using the, these little plastic, um, they're like shot glasses, I suppose, um, that you, you can put your uh, product into and just... Uh, you can fully gather up the navel and inside it and hold it up to the the the, the lamb and uh, you know you you get in full coverage. I've seen people spraying as well and they, they they're for once it's done properly and done carefully. It's it's equally. Um, most cases you're talking of um a ten percent iodine solution. Um, or there's there's also products that are based on on chlorhexidine. Are there are products that have are, are a combination of both? Um, I don't think it, look at it, I don't think it matters too much what what what, what, what which product you use uh, from once it's done as soon as possible after birth, uh, and it's a good practice as well to repeat it within a few hours um, after birth because it's 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 drying up the navel and it's 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 sealing off that that potential source of of uh, them taking in infection. Perfect, and just we'll go back to James again with this next one. Um, what size should individual pens be? Ideally, five foot by six foot. You'd be talking 30 square foot. Most farmers are using sheep pearls, and you know, they come in various different sizes. To come, the standard sizes are really five foot and six foot. While you could go five foot by five foot, the pen is relatively small, especially if you always three lambs and you're talking 25 square foot. The likelihood of her lying on a lamb in a pin that small is increased, stands to reason, less room like, more likely to lie in a lamb. But a good standard pin would be, a good standard would be five foot by six foot, 30 square foot would be a nice size pin for a yo with two lambs. It would leave space for a bucket. Do you know, you have to have, does a yo in it? There's a 70, 80 kilo yo in it. There's two lambs in it. There might be a bucket for meal and there might be a bucket on the gate for water. So 30 square foot. Okay, perfect. Um, just Damien, we'll throw this one to you. Um, I know a person who is starting a flock from pet lambs and is wanting to buy pet lambs for me. Would you recommend this? Why or why not? Um Look, at, I suppose there's no, I suppose to answer the question, there's no reason why um, a lamb or a yo lamb will say reared as a pet um, wouldn't be fit for, for, for breeding in, in the coming years. Um, it's just, I would be, um, they, they need to be very well managed, um, you know, in terms of rearing. Uh, I would be looking at uh, getting them reared um on one of the systems mentioned earlier, probably the one uh, where um, 
the, well, the first, the, going back to the start, the first thing is that uh, in terms of uh, disease prevention and so on, that the that the lamb that's going to be artificially reared gets a sufficient feed of uh, colostrum to start with, and following on that they are are properly managed in the in the rearing period, um, in terms of um you know, getting the, the, as outlined earlier, the, the, the correct amount of, of uh, milk replacer um, access to, to, to creep feed. And the, the other thing, you'd be probably looking at maybe clostridial vaccinations and that kind of thing um, that they, they, they uh, would be given at the, the recommended time at uh, four or six or eight weeks of age um, in order to, to prevent um, clostridials and that. But there's no reason. There's no reason why. Um, there's no reason why not. I suppose. Uh, but probably would want to have a look at the the castings as well that we were mentioning earlier, um, and wonder would it be easier to to buy your lambs, uh, reared your lambs um, next next uh, August time. Um, so that that's the you know there is a, there is a cost attached to it. I, I assume that uh, the old lambs or the pet lambs are not being given away either. So you need to add on the cost of rearing them onto that and see to, to make it make it make his mind up after that. Yep. And just to go back, James again, um, is injecting glucose into a lamb a job for the vet only? Well, you'd, you've seen Damien's video there. It's not a simple, it's not a simple task now. You'd have to, you know, my own opinion of it is you'd have to be trained. You'd definitely have to have seen a professional doing it beforehand. Like, I wouldn't like to go at it for the first time not having seen it done before. So ideally, you'd have it seen before and ideally you'd have somebody with your hole in the lamb following the guidelines as good as you could. Yep. And just go back to Damien for this next one. Um, after how many days should I put lambs on the feeder? Um, yeah, uh, again, I suppose what we're saying is uh, 24 to 48 hours after birth. Uh, and the, the critical thing, uh, so if, you're taking, if you take the example of a triplet uh, that lambs down, hopefully she's enough for milk, uh, that they'll all get a good feed of colostrum for the first 24 hours. And that you're taking the you're taking the lamb uh, uh, for between twenty four and forty eight hours. Uh, the reason is, is for that is in terms of the the artificial feeders or the, the ad lib feeders. It's it's much easier to get the lamb trained onto the feeder at that stage. If you leave them too long on the o, uh, it can be har harder to get them trained onto the the ad lib feeder. So twenty four to forty eight hours. Normally in practice, the way it happens is suppose is on farms that. There'd be a certain time of the day, whether it's in the morning when things are done, that you go around and, and, and transfer on any pet lambs that need to join the, the pet lamb feeder. Okay. Um, we'll just go back to James here again. And the next question is on colostrum. So how do you rate how colostrum as a colostrum substitute? And then how does it compare with artificial colostrum? Well, in terms of colostrum, firstly, you'd look at the O's colostrum, the, the, the mother of the lamb, ideally having enough colostrum for the lamb. Thereafter, you'd be looking for another yo. Thereafterwards, you'd be looking for colostrum from another yo in the flock. After that, you'd be looking at cow colostrum. Now, a lot of farmers at that stage, they'll use artificial colostrum rather than cow colostrum, but cow colostrum from a cow that is vaccinated for the various clostridial diseases would be preferable. And of course, again, a cow from your own farm, if you like, would be better again. But while it is good cow colostrum it is sufficient like ideally you'd have a stock what we'd be recommending there and Damien would be recommending it too is that if you had a single yo that would have surplus colostrum you'd be freezing that colostrum you'd be milking out that yo freezing that colostrum and then torn it out torn it out slowly for the yo so ideally we'd be going back to colostrum off your own yo's freeze it when you get an opportunity to get it and not having that saying if you hadn't that you'd be going on to cow colostrum then but ideally the first port of call will be looking at your own sheep to have enough colostrum and freezing freezing 
the colostrum off yours that have surplus single your loads of colostrum free some of that yep that's great um we'll go back to damien here again um can i overfeed soya um you can i suppose uh, you, you you can um it's i suppose it takes it takes energy really to to, to process the soya you'd want to go uh, a good bit over the top to uh, to 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 have an effect on the yo uh, basically it's not stored in the in the yo's body and it's 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 it's, it's a waste i suppose to 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 overfeed um, I suppose when we talk about the 100 grams per lamb carried, um, it includes anything that m- may be in the ration already. So do you know what I mean? If you already have a, a fairly good level of soya in the ration and you're given further supplementary soya, um, you, you could be overfeeding at that stage. But um, it's 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 generally not not a, not a big problem, but it, you, you could you could potentially. But it, really what you're doing is burning energy. Uh, by the O to process it and it's just excreted as waste afterwards then. Yep. Um just going back to James then. Um this farmer is having trouble with big lambs. Uh me feeding yours inside now, what should this farmer do? Start cutting back on the meal. If the lambs are coming too big, really start cutting back on the meal. Like as well as that yours inside, they're sitting down a lot. You know, they're not getting as much as exercise as yours outside. If you're feeding yours outside, they're walking around, they're doing a lot of forage and the lamb is moving more in the womb. You know, the lamb is moving more because the yours, you have a fitter lamb in the womb. Lamb's coming very big, taper back, taper back the meal and let's give it a week, see how they're coming. But... Once they're that size, definitely, it sounds to me like overfeeding. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, just Damien then. Um, where can the glucose injection be got? Uh, any names would help. Yeah. Um, well, I suppose the, the, there, there's a powder form that you'd get in most um, pharmacies or, or health stores. It's, it's dextrose powder. So... In order to make up, a, you're, you're trying to make up a 20% solution. Um, so it would be, say, 80 mils of sterile water, which is boiled water that you're allowed to cool. And add your 20 grams, um, add your 10, 20 grams of dextrose powder, which you'll get, um, I don't know the brand name of one of them, but it's, it's glucose powder, really. Um, what we've seen in the video there, I, I can't think of the brand name of it, but there is sort of a glucose solution made up that you get be similar to the bottle of calcium jet or one of these that you would get for for uh, calcium deficiency. Um, the, you could get them in some of the veterinary supply shops as well, or there's uh, the, uh, the likes of glucogel or, or, or similar things that are, are also available in in um, in tubes or sachets in the in the in the pharmacy. So, um, you know, the, the, those are kind of those are kind of the options uh, in terms of getting the. Getting the product or having it having it to hand if you if you need it. Grand and and just the last question, we'll throw over to James. Um, what about using a goat as a foster mother? Damien, it's an unusual <laughs> one. Damien, <laughs> I've never seen that. I've never seen that done now. To be honest, yeah. and. I'm not sure. Maybe Damien, you'd be. I, I don't have any experience of it either. I've no, never so seen that one. It's, no, it's that's definitely a now, unique question it's... now. I never heard it before, but mm. I don't know, Damien. What do you think? You know, I suppose we we can't we can't ru- rule it out for. But, um, I I don't have any experience of it to be honest with you. I, I I I don't. I don't know. We'll have that one for the next webinar, Damien. I think we'll have to. We'll have to. Do a bit of research I, on that. that. Yeah, yeah. There probably isn't any reason why they wouldn't rear them. I would, as I come back to James's colostrum story, I suppose if they, if, if ideally, if they could get some your colostrum into them, they, I, I, I've no doubt, uh, uh, um, there'd, there'd be, um, there'd be enough of energy and so on, and, and in the, um, in the, in the goat's milk to, to rear them, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, I, I don't know. After that, had the, the practicalities of, of getting the, the lamb onto them and so on. But yeah, it should work. It should work when you think about it. But yeah, yeah, sure. I might go back over to Penny. So, 
Brilliant. Thanks very much Owen, for the Q&A session. And I'd just like to thank James and Damien again for a fantastic presentations this evening. Um, I think everyone really got a lot out of them. Um, I suppose I'd just like to mention that this webinar has been recorded this evening and will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, the links will be shared, the link to the video will be shared on our Twitter and Facebook page in, in the next week or so, I think. Um, I'd just like to also mention the upcoming webinars for our region. So on the 21st of February, we're having a first fertilizer and lime webinar and then on the 7th of March we'll be having an organics webinar. So I'd like to thank everyone for their attendance this evening and hope everyone has a, a, a great night and hopefully no one's kept up too long with any lambs. <laughs> thanks very much. Okay thanks yeah. thanks very Bye much. Everyone. Thanks thanks.